from CPRI and the CPRI Knowledge Hub, this is Research Minutes, a weekly look at new and important research and education. Today, we look at early childhood education in the wake of a pandemic and how pre-K centers have responded to a year of disruption. On so many fronts, including early childhood education, the pandemic is not over yet. We welcome the University of Michigan's Christina Weiland and Boston Public Schools' Annie Taylor, co-authors of a new policy brief examining the pandemic's impacts on Boston's universal pre-K program. They share their findings. We found that centers implemented a pretty wide variety of operational changes to improve children's and staff and families' safety, and many of these changes came with additional direct costs and some key takeaways for early childhood policymakers, practitioners, and other stakeholders across the country. And we as a country have really underinvested in early childhood for decades, and we're seeing just how fragile the sector is as a result. That's right now on Research Minutes. Hello and welcome to Research Minutes. I'm Keith Yumuller, Managing Editor of the CPRI Knowledge Hub. Today, we're happy to be speaking with Christina Weiland, Associate Professor in the School of Education at the University of Michigan. Welcome back to the podcast, Chris. It's great to be back. Thanks for having us. And we're also speaking with Annie Taylor, Evaluation and Data Manager for the Department of Early Childhood with Boston Public Schools. Thanks so much for joining us, Annie. Thanks for having me. So today we're discussing your new policy brief, which was co-authored by a team of researchers and partners from the University of Michigan, the Harvard Graduate School of Education, MDRC, and Boston Public Schools, titled Effects of COVID-19 on Early Childhood Education Centers, Descriptive Evidence from Boston's Universal Pre-Kindergarten Initiative. Uh, It's work that grew out of an ongoing study of universal pre-K programs in Boston and It sheds new light on the early childhood impacts of the pandemic. Uh, To start, could you just give us a little bit of context in general? How were American pre-K programs affected in the immediate wake of COVID-19? And what did you think you could learn from ECE centers in Boston? So American pre-K programs have been pretty differentially affected by the crisis. And how they've been affected falls loosely into three categories. So in the first are those that are part of public systems in which the teachers in the programs are treated like K-12 teachers. Many of them are unionized, but not all of them. And But these have really fared the best. So they've had the assurance that they'll be continue to be paid even if programs have to shut down for a bit or go remote, just as K-12 teachers have had that assurance during the crisis. We aren't scared really that these programs are going to disappear in the same way that we don't worry that first grade might not be there in the fall when the dust settles and hopefully we're recovering from the crisis. In the second bucket are programs with a connection to a public pre-K system or other public funding, but might be in community-based settings and not in public schools. And so that's the focus of our study and our policy brief. So these programs generally reopen before public schools that they were serving kids um, well before their public school counterparts open, but they felt more of a crunch in terms of financing and stability uh, and enrollment. So in some places, CBO teachers and these programs are paid like those in public schools, but that's generally much less common than if the program are based in the public schools. And finally, there are the pre-K programs that are largely unconnected to public systems in which parents pay or there's a combination of parent pay and child care subsidies. So some of those programs have since shut down entirely. Some have opened at reduced enrollment and yet have seen their costs go up really significantly due to the crisis. And there have been some help for these programs, but generally in the immediate wake of the crisis, they were hurting the most. And some states did relax policies like letting the child care subsidies that they might have been receiving uh, be based on enrollment and not attendance. But that was the case in less than half of states. So these were harder hit. So in Boston, We were tracking the implementation of universal pre-K, which is happening primarily there in community-based sites. And we began our work with them in June 2019, about nine months before the crisis really hit the U.S. and hit pre-K programs. So Boston's in the middle of expanding access and quality to its UPK program through CBO sites. 
and putting into place pay parity policies so that teachers in the CBO sites are paid like their public school counterparts and making a lot of investments in quality and, and instruction and curriculum there. So the goal of our broader study has always been to identify what needs to be tweaked in Boston's successful public schools model to make it work equally well in the CBOs. Uh, and that's because even though most pre-K systems around the country are mixed in terms of having CBO and public school classroom, there's really very little research to inform programs on decisions about how to build quality equally in both of those settings and adjust the models appropriately to meet what kids um, and teachers in those settings need to make it work well. And so in other words, we're just asking the simple question, how do you build it in this new context? So when the crisis hit Boston, like it hit centers across the country, we really pivoted to following the experience of centers as they weathered the crisis, right? And what we've seen as we've read work from other places and followed the centers in Boston is that Boston is something of a best case scenario in all this. So the funding in the UPK program was made really flexible and the payment was based on enrollment uh, pre-pandemic and not attendance, like who kept coming during the crisis. And the state of Massachusetts relaxed those policies as well to make sure that centers that were receiving childcare subsidies, which are targeted to low-income families, that those were continuing to be paid. So uh, the centers, too, were supported by coaches to help teachers adapt curriculum and instruction for when the classrooms reopen, as well as health and safety practices. And so we really wanted to come into this documenting the effects of the crisis on the center, both to inform how Boston's going to carve a path forward and out of the crisis, but also to offer a perspective within the field on what did the crisis look like in these more kind of best case scenarios like the one in Boston. And could you walk us through your approach a little bit? How did you attempt to answer those questions? Sure. So like Chris said, our goal was to really understand how UPK centers were affected by the pandemic. And when the pandemic hit, most centers closed following the Massachusetts stay-at-home order in March 2020. We were already observing the UPK classrooms and monitoring children's enrollment in the centers in the context of their research practice partnership with Boston Public Schools. So as Chris mentioned, we then adapted our research questions accordingly to really explore how the pandemic had a affected the center's staff turnover, to what extent there were changes in enrollment, and how centers were adapting to the challenges of operating during a pandemic. So in the late summer, centers started obtaining authorizations to reopen, and to do so, they had to submit uh, their reopening plans in writing. So we collected and analyzed those plans, and we continued tracking children's enrollment and then when centers fully reopened for their second year of UBK in September of 2020, we used administrative records to identify teachers and administrators who had left the program for this second year of UBK. And simultaneous to this, our colleague Louisa Penfold from the Harvard School of Education interviewed administrators on their experiences navigating this pandemic. So let's jump right into your findings then. What did you learn about teacher and administrator turnover in the centers that you studied? So we learned that 18% of UPK teachers and 10% of UPK administrators did not continue working at their centers for this second year of the program. We analyzed how staff leaving UPK centers was distributed across the centers, and we found that almost half of UPK centers lost at least one teacher. We unfortunately weren't able to collect information on why they left UPK, but our colleague Louisa in her interviews found that staff turnover was mainly due to personal reasons, like their own childcare needs or concerns related to their personal safety if they return to in-person teaching. These turnover rates are actually lower than in other contexts or communities before the pandemic. So for example, in Louisiana, 31% of preschool teachers that were in the workforce in 2017-2018 left their program by that next school year. And in New York City, survey results obtained in the 2016-2017 school year showed that 69% of centers lost at least one of their teachers. So although UBK turnover rates are lower than those that I just described, they are still concerning, especially because UBK exemplifies really, as Chris mentioned, a best case scenario where programs continued to receive funding during the pandemic, regardless of children's attendance. And did you learn anything about student enrollment during that time? 
So we did. The enrollment in the winter of 2019, so pre-pandemic, was about 86%. And this decreased by 30 percentage points in the fall of 2020, when enrollment was at 56%. It did then recover by 14 percentage points by the winter of 2021, so this past January, at which point 70% of UBK seats were filled. Tiara Dias and the UBK admin team from Boston Public Schools are in constant contact with the CBOs and working to understand what the programs can do to meet the family's needs and increase the program's enrollment. And really, our BPS partners have told us that the CBOs are working really hard to adapt and have been working really hard to adapt to the needs of families this year. They're offering new remote and hybrid learning opportunities to meet families where they're at. And the UPK team, both admin and the centers, are continuing to explore how we can reach more families next year while also maintaining the quality elements of UBK that are so, so critical. You just touched on this a little bit, and I'm, I'm curious if you found that centers changed their approach or the educational experiences for students changed at all in response to the pandemic. Yes, definitely. This was one of the things we really saw in those reopening plans that I mentioned. We found that centers implemented a pretty wide variety of operational changes to improve children's and staff and family safety. And many of these changes came with additional direct costs. So we analyzed instruction and routines, staff scheduling, cleaning and daily screening practices, and communication with families. And across all these areas, Centers reported they would implement, on average, 21 changes, and we estimated that at least nine of such changes require additional investment from programs. And our list obviously was not exhaustive, since centers might have needed to implement even more changes than those they anticipated during last summer when they submitted those plans. However, we do know they implemented, on average, more than five changes to their instruction and routines, and that's obviously what really impacts students in the classroom. So for example, centers reported needing to purchase individual learning materials for each child. And since sensory-based learning is a huge part of early learning, UPK teachers needed to purchase, for example, individual sand and water tables for each child instead of there being one large sand table for the whole class. And as you can imagine, this comes at a significant expense for the centers. We also found that teachers had to rearrange classrooms to accommodate social distancing regulations, with many sites needing to purchase new tables or chairs to maintain that social distancing space between children. And we saw things like setting marks for personal space and staggering group schedules to reduce contact among the children at the centers. Teachers also reported having to modify group learning activities and replacing them with individual ones. And some of the educators we talked to have expressed concerns about children's limited ability to socially interact with their peers during the pandemic and the impact this may have on their social and emotional development. However, obviously, the exact effects of these social distancing adaptations on children's development aren't quite known yet. I do want to touch on the centers also implemented four changes to their staff scheduling on average. For example, Many of them reported needing to hire additional staff, in particular cleaning staff. They reported reorganizing teachers' work hours and breaks and providing conditions for staff to be trained on new safety protocols. Along those same lines, centers implemented around eight changes for cleaning and screening practices in compliance with CDC guidelines. The most common changes we saw were designating staff an additional area for isolation. Teachers also incorporating cleaning within their work routine and implementing screening protocols at drop-off. And lastly, centers reported on average four changes to their family engagement strategies, mostly centered around sharing information and securing immediate and effective communication with families. And interestingly, many staff interviewed in the study discussed a positive growth in the amount of communication between centers and parents. So Teachers have been reaching out to families via email or text, message, phone calls, and Zoom to discuss children's learning and really bridge that gap between the at-home and in-person learning. The last thing I really want to highlight on this is that these changes are important in a lot of ways, 
and have two pretty important implications for teachers and children. On the one hand, teachers' routines are becoming even more demanding than what they already were before the pandemic. Some centers might have had the financial capacity to hire additional staff or improve their cleaning contracts, but most teachers might have had to include cleaning and screening practices in their existing teachers' routines. But fortunately, UBK teachers are supported by UBK coaches. But regardless of of the amount of support a teacher might have, these additional activities or things that they needed to do can take a toll on teachers' well-being. On the other hand, children are adapting to learning environments and protocols. And in the interviews Louisa conducted, administrators reported really how resilient and flexible children were as they were keeping physically distant from each other or adhering to instructions of not sharing materials and wearing their masks, to name just a few of the components of what is really their their new normal. We've spoken about Boston's universal pre-K program on the program here before, and, and you mentioned in this interview that a lot of these outcomes might be best case scenario or close to best case scenario. But you know, across the country, early childhood centers are are still facing significant challenges, partly due to post-COVID enrollment decreases staffing losses and funding shortfalls. Uh, So following your work here, I'm curious what recommendations you might have or what takeaways you might offer to early childhood policymakers, program leaders, and other stakeholders who are attempting to deal with those challenges. So yeah, on so many fronts, including early childhood education, the pandemic is not over yet. And the biggest takeaway I think we've seen in the sector is just how much the crisis has showcased that a high quality, well-funded zero to five system is essential infrastructure, just like bridges and roads are. And we as a country have really underinvested in early childhood for decades, and we're seeing just how fragile the sector is as a result. As a country, for example, we spend just about $400 in public funds per year per child age 0 to 3 on early care and education, compared to nearly $13,000 per student per year in kindergarten um, through 12th grade. Parents really need to care for their young children to work, and at the same time, 0 to 5 is the period when kids' brains are developing most rapidly. And we particularly really need to get our act together at the federal level. We know states can't do this alone. It's going to take federal policy and resources to build the system that our kids and our families deserve. And federal policy, to be fair, is really making some strides. So the America and Rescue Plan passed recently includes funds for early care and education that constitute the largest public investment in the sector in U.S. history. And these funds are really going to be essential for stabilizing the sector and getting back to square one where we were before the pandemic. As well as that, President Biden's recently announced infrastructure plan would provide another $25 billion to build childcare facilities, which have long been in short supply. And that there's an expected second installment of the infrastructure plan from the Biden administration. And hopefully that will be what lays the blueprint for a long term plan for a coherent, accessible, and equitable zero to five system. And finally today, um, do you think that there are opportunities here for future research, either for your team or others potentially in other states who are tracking the impacts and the resiliency of pre-K programs? Yes, absolutely. Um, Some of us on our team are in fact currently working with Erica Greenberg and Grace Lutmer at the Urban Institute, Daphne Basuk at the University of Virginia, Anna Markowitz at UCLA, and a larger group of early childhood experts and policymakers to review what we know about the effects of the crisis on the early childhood sector and young children. We have been building on a list from another team at the Urban Institute led by Julia Isaac that's turned up already over 250 studies that are in process or have results out documenting the effects across the country. So we're going to be learning on so many fronts from the studies that have happened already and are underway around the crisis. And hopefully they are going to help to point the way to evidence-based, equity-centered ways to recover from the crisis. If we know anything, we know that this crisis has not hit either the education sector equally. It's hit early childhood harder than K-12. And it's also hit families of color and families with low incomes harder um, than their counterparts. So some of this evidence is going to have to really help us find ways to accelerate learning within um, children from those backgrounds. 
Well, this is great work as always, and we want to encourage our listeners to go read the full brief. Again, it's titled Effects of COVID-19 on Early Childhood Education Centers, Descriptive Evidence from Boston's Universal Pre-Kindergarten Initiative, and you can find it at edpolicy.umich.edu. Christina Weiland and Annie Taylor, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thanks for listening to this week's Research Minutes, presented by the CPRI Knowledge Hub. For more episodes or to subscribe to the series, you can find us at researchminutes.org. To share thoughts on today's episode or to suggest a future topic, you can follow us on Twitter at CPRI Hub. That's C-P-R-E Hub.